Hi, I'm Will Holmgren from the University of Arizona. And I'm Justin Sharp of Sharply Focused. And we're pleased to have an opportunity to talk today about the Solar Forecast Arbiter, an open source evaluation framework for solar forecasting. This project is a collaboration between the University of Arizona, Sharply Focused, Sandia National Labs, the Electric Power Research Institute, and is funded by the Department of Energy, Solar Energy's Technology Office. Evaluation of solar forecasts encompasses a lot of topics. So the solar forecast arbiter has a lot of pieces. For years, we've seen renewable energy forecasts validated and analyzed using a range of ad hoc methods and that have resulted in constant recreation of the wheel, non-repeatable results and disputes over their validity. We wanted to change that. When we proposed the platform to the Department of Energy, we wanted to build something that the community could use that was standardized, objective, and extensible. Thus, all of the project software is implemented in open source packages available on GitHub. We encourage the community to view, audit, and improve our code. We also wanted to make sure that it served the community's needs. So before any design even started, we began our stakeholder outreach to inform what functionality the platform needed. As a result, many aspects of the platform were informed by solar forecast stakeholder input. A big thank you to all of you who are listening today that have provided feedback to our pro project proposals. If you're not already registered for our stakeholder email list, please join us by visiting solarforecastarbiter.org. A big item was the ability to perform multi-vendor uh, multi trials with anonymization where necessary. But users also wanted to be able to conduct analysis on their own on an ongoing basis to assess their providers and their in-house forecasts and how they were doing, and also have the capability to do retroactive analysis of forecast improvements resulting from research advances. In addition, we should note that the analysis is only as good as the quality of the ground truth data that is used, and only useful in the context of reference forecasts. The system therefore incorporates the capability to quality control the data uploaded to it and to provide reference forecasts for that data. In addition, reference data sites provide an easy way to test forecasts against public ground truth data. The Arbiter manages all of these use cases for deterministic forecasts, generic event forecasts, and probabilistic forecasts. The end result of an evaluation is a web-based report with interactive graphics and downloadable CSV metrics. The Arbiter workflow can also be automated by scripting against the web application programmer's interface. We take data security very seriously indeed. All of the uploaded data is private by default. We provide features that allow you to securely share your data with other users, such as prospective clients or vendors, but the choice to do that is always yours. Data policies are governed by a standard data use agreement that all participating organizations must sign. The data use agreement is very friendly to users and severely limits what we, as framework administrators, can do with your data. We will not disclose your data. It remains yours at all times. So how do I use the Solar Forecast Arbiter? Let's step through a generic workflow for the Arbiter. Your specific workflow might look a little different depending on what exactly you want to do with the metadata or data that may already exist within the Arbiter. The first step is to define the site, observation, and forecast metadata. Evaluation scenarios are largely defined by these metadata definitions, so they're important to get right in the beginning. Sites must be defined before observations and forecasts are associated with them. The site metadata includes fields such as latitude and longitude. It can also include standardized high-level metadata to describe a PV power plant such as DC capacity, AC capacity, the tracking or fixed parameters of the system, and module temperature coefficients. Users can opt to provide more complicated metadata using a freeform extra parameters field. Once a site is created, a user may create observation or forecast metadata at that site. The image on the left, on the right, shows an example of forecast metadata creation page at a solar power plant. The pre-existing site metadata is displayed in the table at the top, 
the input forecast metadata fields are displayed below. The user must specify fields such as the variable type, such as GHI or power, the time of day the forecast is issued, the lead time to the forecast start, the length of each forecast run, the length of the intervals that comprise the forecast, and the interval label. This leaves no room for misinterpretation of what the forecast represents. In case it's not clear, this metadata is used to describe a concatenation of series of forecast runs. For example, we might specify metadata for day ahead hourly interval forecasts issued at 1300 each day, or perhaps metadata for hour ahead forecasts with five minute intervals issued at the top of the hour. If you have the right permissions, you can also choose to define new observations and forecasts at sites that you do not control. Most commonly, this will come up for the reference data sites. For example, you can create a new forecast at a SurfRad site and later compare it to the reference forecast that we provide for that site. The forecast remains private to your account, despite the fact that it is associated with the reference site that we created. Once you've defined the metadata for a forecast or observation, you can upload time series data that will be associated with that metadata. Time series data may be uploaded in CSV or JSON formats, and the upload page provides examples of the required formats. You can also upload and download data and metadata using a RESTful HTTP API. The arbiter will reject any uploads that do not conform to the metadata that they're to be associated with. For example, if your metadata describes hourly interval data, then your time series must have hourly resolution. If forecast data is uploaded as part of an operational trial, the API imposes gating requirements that prevent users from uploading data after the required submission time. The arbiter passes observation data through a data quality toolkit and marks each timestamp with informational flags such as day night, clear cloudy, and more serious flags like stale values. If you'd like to, you may also opt to share your data with other users of the Arbiter. This is entirely optional. You can keep all of your data private to your own account. The example at right shows a utility granting read access to its observational data to two different forecast vendors. You can imagine a complementary example in which each of the forecast vendors grants this utility read access to their corresponding forecast, but not to the other forecasters' forecasts. Now that you have the right data uploaded to the Arbiter and perhaps someone has shared some data with you, you're going to navigate over to the report creation form and set up the evaluation scenario. First, you provide a name and the start time and the end time. Then you select the observations and forecasts to compare. These can be the metadata and data you uploaded in steps one and two, or they can be the framework supplied reference data or forecast. If necessary, observation data will be resampled to match the forecast intervals. We never resample forecast data. Next, you select the metrics of interest for the report, including options such as mean absolute error, mean bias error, root mean squared error, normalized versions of these metrics, and metrics that describe distributions. Metrics for event and probabilistic forecasts are also available. Then you select the time categories over which the metrics will be calculated, such as the total by day or by hour. Finally, you click submit and wait a few seconds or a few minutes, depending on the amount of data to be processed on our server. And what you get at the end is this report. Uh, the image on the left shows a screenshot of the metadata section of the report. Note that there's links to download the report as an HTML file or a PDF file. There's a PGP key ID associated with the report. There's time series plots and scatter plots. These are all made using the Plotly library, so they're interactive and downloadable. There's a table of the metrics, the summary metrics. Uh, this can also include forecast skill or normalization and dead bands associated with the metrics. And finally, some graphics showing, for example, metrics by month, by date, and by hour. There are a lot of uh, technical components to the Solar Forecast Arbiter. Uh, these include the web-based user interface, and that's how most people are going to interact with the Solar Forecast Arbiter, especially getting started. And that's what most of the screenshots that I've shown you today are from. 
There's the API for scripting. Everything is implemented in a Python software package for analysis. There are scripts to redeploy this entire software stack on your own server if you'd like to. There's all the detailed supporting documents and all of this of course is supported by stakeholder input and feedback. It's developed on GitHub and many of our project discussions take place out in the open on GitHub issues and pull requests. We encourage you to browse those to better understand the history of the project. So as Will just mentioned, things are very transparent within the project and getting started is really easy and the project team has done an awesome job of creating online documentation as we've gone along for everything as the systems evolve through design and implementation and as Will just mentioned, even some of the project conversations are documented there. Anyone can create an account to browse the public data and the reference forecasts, but to really utilize the full capability of the system, you need to sign the use agreement. This document is called the data use agreement. There are some historical reasons for that because it describes in part how your data is protected and how your organization can interact with other data on the system. For instance, if an organization is willing to expose their data to the public, they can benefit from free reference forecasts. However, you don't need to do this. And the term data use agreement is somewhat of a misnomer as it's really a platform use agreement. It gives you the right to be able to use the platform and the data that is publicly available within it. You can rest assured that your own data remains yours, is private by default and remains in your control at all times. If at some point you need to remove it or just want to remove it, that decision is yours and you can do it immediately. Once the data use agreement is signed, the platform administrator will grant you full access to the platform capabilities and you can start to explore and experiment. For instance, you could consider starting small with a simple project, simple problem rather, like validating existing forecasts against observations. We're looking to fully test all the features of the system now that we're in a late beta version, especially running um, an operational forecast trial, a fully operational forecast trial. Getting involved at this point is a win-win for both you and for the project team, as we're really motivated to hold your hand and walk you through all the capabilities so that we can get all of your feedback from you and you can become an evangelist for the platform. If you really love it, you can help us to extend it by adding modules to the system. Staying informed is really simple. Just sign up for our mailing list. Do it now, there's absolutely nothing to lose. So this last slide, or second last slide, provides a summary of the capabilities. Notice that there are a lot of parallels that can be drawn back to the recommendations made in the output from Work Package 2 of the IEA Task 36 for wind forecasting. Three members of the Solar Forecast Arbiter team, Will Holgram, who's on this um, movie, myself, Justin Sharp, and Aidan Tui either contributed to or reviewed this work package. We've tried to incorporate all the important best practices that were discussed with the IEA team. So in closing, we'll be available to discuss the framework and this presentation and any questions that come for it, from it during the IEA WinTask 36 meeting in this coming week. Currently, I believe that we're slated to be on the panel that will present on June 24th, 2020 at 15.30 Central European time. That's 9.30 Eastern time and Will and I will be up bright and early at 6.30 a.m. Pacific. Thanks for your interest and for listening.